In a new seven-part audio documentary series, The Intercept offers a comprehensive look at the Trump presidency, featuring interviews with lawmakers, journalists, activists, and historians. This podcast takes a deep dive into the inner workings of the Trump administration. Host of The Intercepted podcast and co-founder of The Intercept, Jeremy Scahill, joins us today to talk about the series, American Mythology, The Presidency of Donald Trump. It's great to see you, Jeremy. Nice to see you, Crystal. Thanks for having me. So um, we all lived through this presidency, right? So just talk about why you thought it was important. You've got a seven-part series here. You dive into different specific aspects of his presidency, from climate change, the corporatocracy, to stacking um, the judiciary with right-wing judges. Why did you think it was important at this moment to sort of take stock of everything we've lived through over these past four years? Well, you know, in a way, all of us in, in this country have been gaslit for the past four years, but not just by President Trump. Um, we've, in fact, be, been gaslit also by elite media culture, by the Democratic Party. And there's this dominant narrative that's taken hold that Trump is somehow this grand aberration of history, that he sort of appeared as an apparition in the night and seized power. Um, when the reality is that Donald Trump is in many ways a manifestation of some of the most dark and violent and disgraceful trends of American history, but also he's the product of an American political system that is largely controlled uh, by corporate interest. Um, and, and, you know, when we look at the election choices now between Biden and Trump, you, you could boil it down to sort of Joe Biden represents the kind of official legalized form of corruption that produces presidential candidates. And Donald Trump is a garden variety crook. Now, having said that, uh, Crystal, I think there are uh, aspects of the Trump presidency that are uniquely dangerous. Um, and I think that some of the policy making has far reaching implications for tens of millions of Americans. But it's important that we not allow the system off the hook and I think that in exploring the particulars of the Trump presidency, you can get a better sense of what is it, what is firmly rooted in the tradition of American presidents and what is abnormal or out of the norms uh, with the Trump presidency. And it's important. It's important. Facts are important. I completely agree with all of that. And I think that framing is so important because it's very comfortable to view Donald Trump as an aberration like just, you know, this sort of foreign virus that invaded. And once we get of him, then we're, we're back and we're good to go and it's all going to be fine. So I want to talk about the, some of the specifics of what he did that, that you see as abnormal and what you uncovered here. But dig a little bit deeper into that idea of the roots of Donald Trump and how, you know, he actually is as American a creation as you can possibly imagine in a lot of ways. Well, you know, I think if you the most accurate way to portray Trump um, is that he is a character who defeated 16 or so uh, establishment Republican candidates, um, including the the Jeb Bush, uh, you know, family dynasty, um, and he essentially uh, dragged the Republican Party kicking and screaming back into power. Um, and what he's done effectively uh, is serve as a sort of Trojan horse for an agenda that had a Paul Ryan or a Marco Rubio or a Ted Cruz uh, or a Jeb Bush been the candidate, the Republicans never would have been able to, to push through. So if you look at the courts, for instance, it's not just that Trump now has secured a 6-3 majority, and it's not just a conservative majority. There are some real fanatical right-wing loonies now on this court. It's not just, oh, there's six conservatives and three liberals. There are a couple of really fanatical lunatics on that court. But Trump also has just shattered records with his federal judicial appointments. Um, and let's not pretend that it's like Trump is some genius with this. He he largely handed over uh, the, the steering wheel to Mike Pence and Mitch McConnell. And the Republicans have already won. Even if Donald Trump loses this election, their agenda, their most extreme agenda has prevailed. That's an incredible, incredible achievement. So to, to, to imply that sort of Amy Coney Barrett um, or Brett Kavanaugh are outside of the scope of, of traditional Republican thinking about the judiciary is, is ahistorical. What Trump has done is, is serve as a very effective salesman and implementer of what are longstanding uh, Republican Party policies and some policies that are golden children of the most extreme elements of the Republican Party. And Jeremy, um, one of the pieces I wanted you to dive into here, the, the final um, part of this you call climate carnage, and you describe as Trump has stacked his anti-science administration with corporate polluters, gutted environmental regulations, and open protected land for extraction. 
We have a brand new example of that. They opened, just announced the um, Tongass Forest in Alaska open for logging now, which is just, you know, a massive level of devastation potentially for the planet. Could you just give some of the other specifics on this piece? Because sometimes, look, I'm sympathetic to the plight of the media in a sense because there's so much going on with this guy all the time, so much of it's salacious, and of course they're looking at juicing the ratings rather than getting into some of the nuts and bolts of what was being done under the surface. But I think this story in particular has been undercovered of some of the damage to the planet that will be tough to reverse that occurred under this administration. Yeah, I mean, you know, the 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 sort of headline grabbing stuff is when Trump says things like he knows better than science um, or, you know, he has directly uh, implied that uh, that the climate crisis is is all a hoax. Um, but in a way, that's that's kind of the carnival barker aspect of of the policy. I mean, it certainly sets the tone. But on a on a sort of on a level of minutia, what what really the story on climate is radical deregulation. Um, and, you know, Trump casts himself uh, in the image of sort of the greatest environmental president since Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but the reality is that uh, and I think Donald Trump actually believes it. I think he has, yes, people around him that have convinced him, oh, you're doing great because you're 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 uh, you're celebrating the great wonders of the American environment. He's opened up Anwar uh, in Alaska for uh, drilling. He's removed stripped protection from environmentally sensitive sites, not just to allow people to roam freely in them, but to allow actual active extraction. Um, on another level, Crystal, we know that Barack Obama was no grand environmentalist. I mean, yes, the Paris Climate Accords were a minuscule series of steps forward, but let's not pretend that you know, Barack Obama was was out there on a Greenpeace vessel confronting oil companies. I mean, he had to be dragged kicking and screaming um, into some of his backtracking on Keystone XL pipeline um, and other pipeline construction. And at times under Obama, uh, protests were suppressed by extreme force, but there were victories won. And Donald Trump just has systematically dismantled them. Um, but this is typical what we see in Republican administrations where, uh, certainly under Bush, you bring in Enron to essentially run energy policy. What Trump has done is taken people like Andrew Wheeler and others who have served as either lobbyists or in some cases lawyers for chemical companies whose job was to circumvent U.S. law, uh, that protect the environment to put them in charge of those uh, those laws. Um, but again, this is not outside of the scope of general Republican Party thinking. Where I think we get into the extremes with Donald Trump, his rhetoric combined with his policies on immigration, they have changed more than 400 immigration rules. Yes, the 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 children in cages, the family separation, rightly get the headlines. But Donald Trump is also making it incredibly expensive and difficult for the very kinds of immigrants that his administration claims that they want, people who are immigrating for family reasons or are people that are well-educated and that would be helpful to the U.S. economy. The Trump administration is not just staked out an anti-illegal immigrant policy. They've staked out the most radical anti-immigrant policy um, in American history, the rhetoric on race, the paramilitarization of law enforcement, uh, the open assassination of an American citizen on U.S. soil. Trump is basically bragging that he sent U.S. marshals to murder someone, an American citizen on American soil. You know, what happened to the rule of law, to being accused, to be able to respond to your accusers? Donald Trump is weaponizing the most dangerous aspects of race, xenophobia, and gender in U.S. culture, and he is uh, making policy that is going to be very difficult to undo on a wide range of, of uh, subjects. I think the um, extrajudicial killing of Michael Reinl in uh, on the West Coast is one of the most unconscionable acts of this presidency. And, you know, we've learned more from reporting about how eyewitnesses all said that went down. And he brags about it as, as retribution, talks about it at his rallies. Um, Jeremy, I'm curious your thought on, you know, given the deep dive that you did here, thinking about Donald Trump, also the reporting, um, you know, you, The Intercept's one of the few outlets that will really turn a critical eye at all sides in terms of power. So you're reporting on Joe Biden as well. What do you think the next phase looks like? What does the next phase need to look like? Look, I mean, Joe Biden is um, is represents, I think, many of the worst aspects of the Democratic Party. In in a sense, you know, you can say Donald Trump is a manifestation of the worst aspects of the Republican Party. 
Joe Biden, if you look at his record over almost a half a century in U.S. politics, um, has been very hawkish on questions of war. Joe Biden not only supported the Iraq war, he was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, the crucial committee that was supposed to be debating the legitimacy of that war. And he actively refused to call any dissenting witnesses, any of the weapons inspectors that had been in Iraq and said, wait a minute, what Bush is saying is not true. Joe Biden didn't just vote for that war. He enabled that war. He helped the Bush administration uh, push forward with it. His policies on crime have been racist to the core, have set a tone for the Patriot Act, which continues in perpetuity uh, to this day. Economic neoliberalism, sanctions. He represents the worst aspects of Democratic Party governance in modern history. At the same time, there is this movement that you guys have reported on extensively on this program um, of democratic socialists, justice Democrats, uh, who have made clear they are not going to accept the Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Barack Obama wing of the Democratic Party as speaking for all of them. And I think that the healthiest perspective right now uh, for people who are disillusioned with the two-party system is to recognize that Donald Trump represents an imminent threat to some of our most vulnerable people. Um, and the Democratic Party is bringing a, uh, a, a squirt gun to a blazing fire. We, we should have no illusions that uh, electing Joe Biden solves a single problem, except we aren't dealing with uh, with a very weaponized Trump administration. Um, Joe Biden is part of the problem. He is not the solution. He may he may be a better opponent for people to face and a safer you know ground to to fight on. But let's not be let's let, let let's let's be very clear eyed here. Joe Biden is part of the pr fundamental problem of the American empire. Yeah, I think that is all very well said. Jeremy, where can people check out the audio series? Just go to theintercept.com and you'll you'll see it. It's called American Mythology. And we had a great team of people working on this. And I appreciate you drawing attention to it, Crystal. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for being with us today, Jeremy. Great to see you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And we'll have more rising for you after this.